Hello, good evening. Uh, this is uh, Subhash Gatade. Uh, welcome, you, welcome you all to the 19th lecture in the Democracy Dialogue series organized by New Socialist Initiative. Our guest this evening is Professor Parvez Hudboy, an eminent physicist, author, public intellectual, and forceful voice for reason, science, and democracy in this part of South Asia. We are really thankful to him for this, uh, for expect, accepting our invite, despite his very busy schedule. It is, rather, it is a bit difficult to introduce uh, Professor Hudbai and the multifaceted work he is doing in few words, but still I will try. Professor Hudbai has a schooling from Karachi Grammar School and has done uh, graduate, postgraduate and doctoral studies from MIT and has taught physics at Kaide the University for, for around 47 years. And he has been a visiting fellow at uh, MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, and University of Mellon, Maryland as well. He is an author of Islam and Science, Religious Orthodoxy and the Battle for Rationality, it, which has been translated in Turkish, Malaysian, Indonesian, Arabic, Spanish, as well as Urdu, Education and the State, 50 Years of Pakistan, Confronting the Bomb, the Pakistani Indian Scientists Speak Out. It's an edited book. He's associated with Mashal Books, uh, which is engaged in bringing out books in Urdu, which are needed for understanding the challenges of our times. In 2003, he was awarded the Kalinga Prize by UNESCO, uh, which is supposed to be the biggest prize in the popularization of science. He has produced and directed many documentaries. One of the first being Raste Ilmke, which was broadcast by Pakistani television weekly which comprehensively reviewed the problems of education in Pakistan. And another series of 13 popular programs, asrar e jahan Mysteries of the Universe, and again for Pakistan television in 2001. He's a key figure behind the formation of Iqbal Ahmad Center for Public Education, which seeks to foster the use of science and reason to understand nature and uh, society. And he's also, he, uh, he is the director, founder, director of Black Hole in Islamabad, which is an educational and intellectual space for science, art, and culture. Most of us who are gathered here are familiar with this, his name mainly through his regular columns, which appear in Dawn, the famous Pakistani Daily Dawn, or his regular interaction, intervention in debate and discussions on TV channels, where he's seen engaging with various issues of concern, or his lectures on YouTube. He is one of those public intellectuals in this part of South Asia who keeps cautioning the people about the havoc societies face when religion starts dominating politics and what needs to be done about it. This evening, his focus will be on the partition of India, three outstanding questions. According to him, these three are particularly important in understanding the past, but which in addition, continue to influence our trajectory. How and wh when and why did the new two nation theory emerge? Why is Pakistan a Praetorian state, but India is not? Was partition preventable? And had it not happened, what might have been the consequences? Friends, please welcome Professor Parvez Hudbai. Parvez. Thank you. Thank you, Subhash. It's a delight to meet so many of my old friends, this I'm speaking from Islamabad. I send you warm greetings, um, namaste, salam, adab, whatever. With this uh, very generous introduction and a synopsis of what I was going to talk about, let me say that uh, the very first question that I would like to pose is, how, when, and why did the two-nation theory emerge? Well, first of all, why is this question important? After all, it's 75 years since Pakistan came into existence as an independent state. It is uh, something that rightly belongs to the past, and why do we need to think about the two-nation theory? The answer is very simple, that it is the official raison d'etre for Pakistan's existence, the reason why Pakistan exists. 
So in spite of all the political turmoil that you hear about Pakistan, there is no one that is currently even asking this question for a very good reason that the two nation theory is what is called the ideology of Pakistan. It was called that after Jinnah died in 1948. And under section 123A of the Pakistan Penal Code, contesting the ideology of Pakistan is punishable by up to 10 years of rigorous imprisonment. Now, having said that, there is no official document that tells you what the ideology of Pakistan is, but there is a street version. Pakistan ka matlab kya la ilaha illallah. Grammatically, as far as Urdu goes, it's, it's wrong. I mean, you can't say the meaning of Pakistan is that there is no God except Allah. But anyway, that that's what it is. So I think it's particularly important to look at this question academically. What and when and how did the ideology of Pakistan come about? In particular, how did the two nation theory emerge, evolve? So to get a proper perspective, you must go back a thousand years, maybe more, to know that uh, India was never a unified whole, that it was fragmented. There was no readily identified Hindu identity, and this according to uh, very reputable Indian historians like Romila Thapar, uh, many others too, like Jha. It was different in different places, shifting over time, and there was um, um, no monolithic, there is no monolithic founder, there's no monolithic set of beliefs, there's no founder of, uh, of uh, Hinduism. And in fact, the very term Hindu comes from the river, the Sindh, the, the, the river Darya Sindhu. And Al-Hind is really, as uh, uh, Romila Thapar points out, an Arabic term which is used as, uh, you, which was used in a geographical context, not in a religious context. Equally, there was no sense of Muslimness amongst those who, amongst those Muslims who lived on the Indian subcontinent. Now, the Arabs had been coming to India even before Islam and they had settled on the western coast of India. Uh, you had then the invasion by Muslims in 712 of Muhammad bin Qasim who came to Sindh and uh, well about we, we, did, we don't uh, have very good records but Chachnama is, is one record, but the best records that we have are those from the Arabic traveler Al-Biruni, who came about 200 years after Muhammad bin Qasim. And uh, uh, Al-Biruni actually was a scholar, a real scholar, who spent something like 13 years learning Sanskrit. And uh, he went from place to place, understanding customs, understanding even Hindu mathematics. And it is probably through him that uh, the zero reached Arabic civilization. Now, what's very interesting is that uh, if you look at the, the writings of Al-Biruni, and by the way, they are available on the, inter uh, on the internet and they're fascinating. He's for him, the real Muslims were the Arabs, Turks, and uh, the Persians. Those Muslims who lived in India, he referred to them as Hindu. Now, isn't that amazing that he would be calling the local converts as Hindu? Because 
this was just a geographical term. It is those people who lived in Al-Hind. And uh, he noted that there is no cohesive identity either among the Muslims over there or the Hindus. And he also noted that when Muhammad bin Qasim came and he defeated Raja Dahir, well, the other Hindu Rajas did not come to the defense of Raja Dahir. Well, let's move on. Even in Mughal times, and that's about 350 years or so, identities were very amorphous. So at the courts of the Mughal people were divided not into Hindu and Muslim factions, but rather into Turkish and Persian ones. And of course, the Turkish and the Persian ones were way above the local Muslims or the Hindus. So it, it was a very mixed bag at that time. You couldn't say that there was a Hindu identity or a Muslim identity in, in India, even in Mughal times. Plus, there was syncretism of, 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 of religion. And in fact, this was developed further by Akbar in his deen e Ilahi. Um, Akbar, and, and of course, every, all, the, all peoples over there at that time were of mixed origin. So Akbar, who was, by the way, a, a Sunni and a Hanaf, and one who belonged to the Hanafi stream, he was half Persian and uh, half uh, um, a local. Jahangir was half Rajput and quarter Persian, and Shah Jahan, he was uh, three quarters Rajput. Well, that syncretism, that adoption of, of uh, local customs, of course, inspired a counter reaction. And we have, even at the time of Akbar, uh, the purifiers of Islam emerging who said that we must get rid of all these things which uh, uh, are really not part of Islam. And uh, the first amongst them was Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Sirhindi. He was followed by Shah Waliullah. And then, of course, his son, Shah Abdul Aziz, who led the insurgency against the British, was another one. Now, uh, Valiullah was very adamant. He said that we Muslims are Arabs and we are in exile in, in India and we must purge all these accretions that are being made into our religion, into our culture. And um, he was um, so this is just at the time of Aurangzeb or so that uh, he writes to Ahmad Shah Abdali. He says, come and so Ahmad Shah Abdali, who was Afghan, he calls upon him to come and invade Delhi. And uh, Ahmad Shah Abdali comes, he uh, purges Delhi, but not of Hindus, of Shias. So it was enormous bloodletting. Well, you could say that the purifiers of Islam did have an effect, but that effect in separating the Hindu and Muslims into two camps was minuscule. It was minuscule because there were far too many different brands of local Islams all around India. And so the diversity defeated the efforts of people like Shah Waliullah and Shah Abdul Aziz and so forth. It's colonialism which was the game changer. If we insist on giving the two nation theory or rather the emergence of two nations a date, I'm not saying it's easy to give a date, but if one has to I think it is 1857, the war of independence or the great mutiny as it's called. Thereafter, the British reinvented 
India. They had to reinvent India because they wanted to rule over it for a very long time. And this involved uh, restructuring India into administrative units. And for having to do that, you needed to know scientifically what would be the proper procedure and what's the scientific method of doing that? You carry out a census. So that census was carried out in 1872, I think, or 1871. And this is the time that you had to declare yourself either as Hindu, Buddhist, or Muslim. And now because jobs in the civil service were all so done on a quota basis, well, it, uh, it really became the basis of, uh, of giving people's definite identities. Now, in this race of getting jobs, the Muslims lost out very, very badly. And so um, there's, there's a lot of documentation on this, particularly by this Englishman by the name of uh, William Hunter. And uh, Hunter actually spends a lot of time, he's from the civil service, and he spends a lot of time in Bengal. And he says that uh, earlier on, you could never conceive of a Muslim as being poor, and now the only Muslims that you see are poor. So this was, um, um, it, it, the Muslims were losing out in, in everything. In um, around the time of the census, it was found that uh, in Bengal, if, if I remember right, that something like uh, out of 500 gazetted officers who were locals, there were just uh, 12 or 13 of them who were Muslims. Uh, in terms of um, those who graduated from Calcutta University, I think Calcutta University was established in 1857. And 20 years after that, the first Muslim graduated. And he was the first Muslim in India to have graduated uh, uh, if I remember right, that is 1870 or so. In that same year, and in the years before, there were, there were uh, every year, a hundred or more Hindus who were graduating with uh, bachelors, uh, probably masters, but I think it was BAs at that time. Now, this is really the issue that then started bothering the Muslims of North India. That uh, they were losing out very badly. Now, earlier, they uh, had a lot of lands. They were, uh, uh, the, since Persian was the language of the courts, they had jobs in the court. But uh, now, because the British changed uh, from Persian to English, they were lost over there. So why did the Muslims lose out? And what is it that caused the split between Muslims and Hindus to grow? I think there were definite economic reasons for that. The Muslims were not equipped for modernity by because of their essentially their attitudes. The attitude was that we are a superior people. We have been given the last word by God in the form of the Quran, which is the literal word of God. We have been the rulers of Hindustan. And it is just bad luck that is visiting us. And so the way ahead is to fight, fight the British, fight the Hindus and regain. But after 1857, it became pretty clear that you cannot do that. Now, earlier on, the British had, had uh, wanted to replace 
local education with uh, with colonial with with modern education colonial education was modern education in those days and to this hindus had responded positively so 1835 is when the macaulay reforms take place and according to that the british east india company will no longer fund either madrasas or pachalas or any other traditional uh, 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 traditional institutions of learning they will only support those schools which teach the english language science and modern subjects now because of the brahmo samaj and people like raja uh, ram mohan roy the hindus were were tuned to that way of thinking there was less resistance i won't say there was no resistance um, hindu reformers had to go through a tough time but muslim reformers and in fact there's only one prominent muslim reformer sir sayyid ahmed khan who tried to do this and he wasn't well i guess he had some measure of success he did succeed in creating the uh, the aligarh university eventually the, and his insistence was that muslims who are in such a bad shape owe this to their neglect of modern subjects in particular english and science and so this was his great jihad uh, for the muslims that you have to now move with the times of course he's a complicated character after all he uh, aided the british uh, at every possible moment of their uh, history of of their being in uh, in india he was um, he was unwilling to criticize even some of their very draconian measures but he justified all this in saying that it's the muslims who have to break with their traditions and unless they do that they're going to get lost and in this i think he was remarkably far sighted because this is what uh, what widened the rift between hindus and muslims now why was there a difference in the first place it's because during the mogal era much of the intellectual work was done by hindus and very little by muslims the muslims were concentrating on looking after their jagirs they were uh, more interested in hunting sports fine poetry so some very good music uh, and and art miniature art came off in those days but there was very little curi curiosity about the natural world and okay now now i really must tell you that uh this is not intrinsic to islam perhaps but it was intrinsic to to indian islam so if one looks back at the 9th through the 13th centuries in in uh, places like baghdad in arabia essentially you do you do see uh, a great spurt in intellectual development of course that started with the influx of that started with the translation of greek works into arabic and then it led to some spectacular results like uh, the theory of light by ibn al hasham the creation of the very the creation of the concept of algorithm by al khwarizmi etc lots of things like that but that never reached the indian subcontinent and one sees that at the time that the british east india company was expanding and it was seeking to uh, bring the inter the interesting new ideas developed during the scientific revolution the moguls showed very little interest in that 
So uh, the interest then was confined to a very different direction. Then comes imperialism, colonialism in a big way, and um, the Muslims eventually lose out. That was when, to my mind, the, the differences started to grow. Now, they did not necessarily have to grow further, but they did. They did because the British certainly had a role over there to play in divide and rule. The more the natives fought amongst themselves, the easier it would be to contain them. And uh, what we see is that parties like the uh, Hindu Mahasabha, this at a later stage emerged. We see that Muslims get more and more communalized, that they are aided on by rulers and by leaders. And we see that um, over time, it is Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan who was initially not a communalist. He develops elements of communalism in him. And then uh, this gets passed on. Now, I'm not saying which community is more at fault, but these rifts grow. And then comes along Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And with his two nation theory, which he articulates in 1940 in Lahore, he says that Hindus and Muslims are two separate peoples. They cannot ever live in peace because they have different heroes, they eat differently, they don't intermarry, etc. He ignores all those centuries of peaceful coexistence. And yes, there was peaceful ex coexistence, even though there was also competition and conflict between them. Let's remember that even at the time of Mughal rule in India, which was which was basically Muslim rule, yet there, was, uh, there were intermarriages. And even at the time of Aurangzeb, we see that some of his generals are Rajputs who want to de defeat Shivaji. So it was much more complicated that, than what Jinnah had set out to be. In the end, I want to say on the end on this point that to my mind, it was these material circumstances which led to the widening of the gap and held, hence ultimately to two distinctive identities emerging. Well, I won't say distinctive, but two uh, identifiable camps. This two-nation theory gave birth to Pakistan in 1947. It's like an umbilical cord. Without stressing the difference between Hindus and Muslims, Jinnah could not have achieved Pakistan. However, once Pakistan was achieved, then he realized that it was now going to be a disaster to play on this anymore. And so his famous speech of 11th of August 1947 comes along in which he says, you are free to go to your mosque, you are free to go to your temples. It is not a matter of the state. You can do whatever you like, etc. And he doesn't at all mention the two nation theory. Well, Jinnah didn't uh, persevere on that. And you could argue that he was uh, old and he was uh, sick. And so uh, that's why he didn't do it. But surely now it is time to junk it. I say this at the risk of uh, running afoul of um, the penalties. But now it is redundant. Let's get rid of the two nation theory. However, I do realize that uh, people in Pakistan as yet cannot say that openly. 
So now let me come to my second question. It's also a question which, um, well, is speculative, but uh, I think it has a more definite answer than the one that I gave for my earlier question. The question is, why is Pakistan a Praetorian state, but India is not? Praetorian is a difficult word, but uh, what it means if you open up the dictionary, it's uh, a state which is dominated by the military, not because the military wants to win wars, but because it wants to have an inordinate amount of influence on the state. And that is a good, uh, I'd say, way of summarizing the Pakistani political system. It is Praetorian in the sense that the military essentially makes all the big decisions that govern the economy, that govern foreign relations, and in the present age, nuclear weapons, and even in such things as making roads or dams, and of course, disaster relief. So what is it that makes Pakistan a Praetorian state? And here we must go back to the very beginnings. When Jinnah started the movement for Pakistan, he uh, <clears throat> had to gather around him people who were influential in the middle, in the in the muslim community at the time and the powerful people were the big landlords there were a few capitalists but mostly these were people with large land holdings yeah some of them may have gone to uh, get degrees in England, but uh, that didn't change their feudal mindset. So the Muslim League was basically a bunch of feudals, feudal landlords, who were, who were convinced that they were the ones who really mattered, and they had great contempt for those below them. And I should say that uh, Jinnah is to be included in that. Jinnah was extremely anti-socialist uh, and extremely anti-communist. And uh, he had actually thought of, uh, while he was in England, he had thought of running for the Tory party. But uh, it turns out that they didn't want to give him a seat. So anyway, he made a lot of money as a lawyer and came back and became very influential in the community of Muslims in India. <clears throat> okay, so when Pakistan came into being in 1947, the Muslim League was intellectually very weak. Jinnah was the only person who had ideas of where to go, what to do, and he was fully in control of things. He didn't trust anybody else in the Muslim League. That's why he appointed himself governor general. And he took all the... And being governor general meant that he had every single bit of authority in his own hands. He couldn't trust the feudals because he knew that they would be fighting for their own local interests, for increasing their, their land, um, uh, getting concessions from the government or whatever. And so um, there was really a vacuum. Now, in this vacuum, there was only one institution that was strong, and that was the Pakistan army. Let's remember that uh, 
this Pakistan army, like the Indian army, was trained in British institutions in places like uh, Sandhurst, for example, or in Dehradun, uh, wherever, and that they, some of them had fought together in the Second World War as well. There was a sense of uh, there, there was a sense of uh, being comrades, and uh, there was this common military culture between the two armies. In fact, in the 1947 and in the 1965 wars where they fought each other, when one would lose to the other, they would be uh, they'd get together still in the uh, and, and have a drink. Well. The difference, I suppose, is that, not I suppose, but the difference between the Indian and the Pakistani armies was that they were faced with different qualities of civilian leadership. So on the Indian side, there was Jawaharlal Nehru, a man who had a vision of India, who even while he was in prison, put there by the British, wrote books and wanted India to be a modern state, one that would move along the direction that the industrialized economies of the world had moved. And so his was, his vision was to aim in a very classical way towards modernity. Now Jinnah too was a modern man, let's not forget that. He too was a modern man, but Jinnah did not have a vision for Pakistan. Jinnah just wanted Pakistan. And here I must tell you that uh, people take it, Pakistanis take it very badly when uh, in discussions, I say that Jinnah did not have a vision for Pakistan because everybody here says the reason Pakistan has gone wrong is that we have not been following Jinnah's vision. And I ask, where is that vision? He never wrote a book. He never wrote a concept paper. He, have, he had been in politics for 20 years or more, well, 30 years or more. And he never told us what Pakistan was to be. He never said that Pakistan was to be a secular state. Sometimes he would say that uh, Islam was the best way and that uh, Islam was the way that Pakistan should go in every field, in politics, in economics, in this, in that but he never made anything explicit. He did not know the Quran. He never quoted from it. He had never known the fact that in history, there has never been such a thing as an Islamic state. So when people used to ask Jinnah before partition, sir, what is Pakistan to be? Is it to be a secular state or a theocratic state? Is it to be a liberal democracy? Is it to be socialist or what? He would say, don't ask this question. Wait until we have territory and then everything will be solved. And so that was his way of postponing that. Why did he do it? Well, because if he had said Pakistan is going to be this or that, well, then he would have lost support from this quarter or that quarter. And so therefore he said, just shut up. Don't ask what Pakistan is to be about. And so my contention is that Pakistan was born in a state of confusion. This is the confusion that allowed the military to become stronger and stronger. And so by 1951, the Pakistan army was taking many major decisions, major initiation, initiatives of its own. So while Ayub Khan was the commander in chief, and this is uh, 
1951 to 1958, he was also the Minister of Defense, and Ayub Khan could veto, this one man could veto anything that the parliament or the government had decided. Anything that he felt that was inimical to the interests of the armed forces. In contrast, I'd say that Jawaharlal Nehru held the Indian army on a very tight leash. The commander-in-chief was not to be given a house as big as that of the prime minister. The army was to be kept out of all major decisions that included uh, relations with uh, foreign countries. Weapon systems had to be approved by parliament. And so the Indian army was never called upon to uh, help in the construction of uh, dams or roads or create its own companies that would, uh, th that, that could be contracted with for constructing these civil works. I think the, the reason is, the reason that India was able to do so, but Pakistan was not, was because India was able to uh, develop a thick layer of institutions. And these are leaders who could forge their identities and capacities in, in some struggle for democracy. And so they were able to maintain this, the, the link between citizens and politicians. That didn't happen in Pakistan. And um, it, it, it was basically because the, the Muslim League had collapsed. By 1951, the Muslim League had essentially dissolved. So this is two years after, three years after Jinnah's death. It went, it just broke apart and it was, and any attempt to revive it would result even in more factionalism because there was no thinking about what Pakistan had to be. Why Pakistan? Sure, there's the two nation theory. Sure, the Hindus and Muslims can't live together, but how do we Muslims live together? There was no thinking on that. And to this day, Pakistan suffers. So even in the current political turmoil, you see this coming up again and again. What's it all about? Okay, so I think I have been able to attempt an explanation of why Pakistan has fallen under the military, under their boots. But now, in the, at the very end, let me come to the question, a very speculative one. Was partition preventable? And had it not happened, what might have been the consequences? Well, look, uh, I, I, I know there are a lot of what if questions in history? What if this had not happened, or if this had happened, or that had not happened, etc.? I know there's not going to be any uh, definitive answer, but why don't we just speculate? So, um, suppose the 1946 cabinet mission plan had been accepted instead of rejected rejected not by the Muslim League, but by the Indian National Congress. Of course, we know, you and I know that Jinnah seized that opportunity. He called for direction, direct action day. And this was, uh, I think, the 16th of August, 1946, after which 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people were dead on the streets. It was his way of saying that now Pakistan has to be made. The Congress has refused, has, has refused to 
be flexible. Hindus want to dominate Muslims. We will not accept it. And so come what may, Pakistan is now to be reality. Well, uh, as many of you know, Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, in his autobiography, he had two sections of that. In the last section, he said that there is something that is not to be revealed until 30 years after I am dead. And when that was revealed, it showed his criticism of Nehru and of Gandhi. And remember that Azad was as close to the Congress and as close to these two people as could possibly be. And he was critical. He says this was a terrible, terrible mistake to have made, to have rejected the cabinet mission plan, to have then brought Pakistan into existence. There could not have been something, anything worse. Actually, Nehru, uh, he gave an interview to the New York Times many, many years later, and he too said, yes, I have second thoughts about that rejection. Okay, but that Let's that, let that be as it may. What would have happened if the cabinet mission plan had been accepted? Well, uh, let's be pessimistic first. <laughs> so pe pessimism is always easier, isn't it? You could have had chaos that continued indefinitely. You could have had a dysfunctional government you could have had a coalition government of Muslims and Hindus in Delhi. But if you're pessimistic, you can always believe that it would have quickly fallen apart, that communal tensions would have flared up again, and this time it would have blazed on and on. After all, peoples who have lived together for a long time, uh, sometimes the tensions cross a limit where living together peacefully is no longer possible. And we see that you had this extreme hate-filled violence of the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosnian Muslims. Certainly, Yugoslavia could not have remained together. Okay, so that's the, that's a possibility. It's possible that uh, the uh, clone of uh, Narendra Modi would have emerged at that time rather than Nehru. Nehru gets displaced and uh, RSS comes up. All these are possibilities. Okay. And we can, today there are a lot of people in Pakistan who are saying that, look what's happened, what's happening in India is justification. It's proof that the two nation theory was correct it's proof that we needed partition okay that's a point of view but i think that one can also be optimistic after all muslims and hindus had lived together for a very long time and on very good terms i can tell you that my father who was a Sindhi, had only Hindu friends, and he was devastated when Pakistan happened. We could have, therefore, hoped for a steady depoliticization of, of religion and far greater tolerance. Let's remember the fact, and this is very, very important, that in 1937, the Muslim League had, was, was, was trounced. It was trashed in Punjab, that very Punjab, which saw the greatest communal bloodletting ever, probably in the history of the world. In 1937, the Muslim League was defeated by the Unionist Party, which had within it Muslim, Sikh and Hindu landlords. They were the powerful people of the time. 
but the unionist party could defeat the the muslim league this is actually the time that jinnah said uh uh forget secular politics now we must go communal whole hog now we have to say that we are fighting for islam that islam is in danger etc so optimistically if if uh, those politicians hadn't been around muslims and hindus could have lived in in peace with each other the benefits of that as we see today would have been enormous there would have been no kashmir dispute there would have been a greater acceptance of modernity among muslims there would have been uh, good universities for muslims to have gone to the ones we have in pakistan are trash i've taught there for now for 47 years as subhash told you and there's not one university which is worth going to so optimistically that could have happened after all such transformations have occurred elsewhere maybe this conflict between hindus and muslims and maulana azad used to say that is that just this is just a transient phase in the life of india that we can all learn to live together well we don't have a definite answer but uh, it's quite likely it could have happened in a parallel universe this is certainly one of the possibilities okay i finished thanks very much thank you uh thank you uh thank you very much for a very enlightening and thought provoking presentation uh professor hudbai uh, uh i will invite first of all our comrade uh, and your long time friend ravi uh to make a few comments about uh, your presentation ravi please thank you subhash and thank you so much always it's such a delight for us such an honor for us to have you here <clears throat> um before i come to the topic of today um i will ask uh, our audience to indulge um a minute or two um because this is a <clears throat> moment of uh, some personal <clears throat> a pride and honor for us also so although subhash has introduced him formally um let me for a minute or two bask publicly in the reflected glory uh this is important because parvez is our first speaker from the other side of the border that was created in 1947 so it is important even if you might see that i am <laughs> kind of indulging um in private things uh, let me just take a minute about that we met i met parvez in 1977 he was finishing his phd at mit and i was just starting mine and he was instrumental in getting me into the area of theoretical nuclear physics he was the teaching assistant in a special nuclear physics course that professor arni muniz was teaching you know the arni muniz who later became obama's energy secretary you know and uh, the thesis that i eventually wrote came out of a homework problem that muniz and parvez had given me it evolved into that of course parvez was <coughs> present in those uh, about a dozen people in a in the marriage party when i got married to kanchan you know so those are the so our association goes that far but for this audience i would like to recount i don't know that parvez remembers or not um parvez and i together were assaulted in kilian in front of kilian court when in 1978 two of us parvez convinced me i was a novice you know as a political activist um parvez convinced me to distribute leaflets against bombing of lebanon that was happening at that time 
and a very right wing zionist student group they came and and assaulted us you know which happened right right inside mit in front of you know dozens of people you know so that was my initiation by parvez into um student activism and you know parvez um i am very um uh, kind of um, i don't like projecting myself parvez um has been a very good physicist which i have been not you know i was a <coughs> mediocre physics very with great difficulty i learned some physics from people like him and i had to leave physics to become an activist i quit physics altogether to become a, become an activist and they are also largely a failed activist but parvez could continue as a good physicist and a great public intellectual all the people who know him on the subcontinent and beyond know his moral political and personal courage so i got this opportunity to pay my tribute to this great friend of mine having said that <clears throat> having said that um let me come to uh today's topic <clears throat> and uh, there are many luminaries in the audience i am sure there will be very rich discussion um because we run the program i get this privilege to make the first comment you know i mean i i will ask forgiveness of my luminary um <clears throat> luminaries in the audience uh, to get to speak first uh, and ask the first question parvez has covered um, this whole thing in so succinctly so comprehensively so although there will be discussion about what he has said and about the past i would like to take him to future what do you see parvez should be done we know that partition was a huge tragedy for the of this subcontinent but what should be done now by that i mean that now after these borders were created three or four generations have lived in two or later three independent countries and if we talk about undoing the consequences of partition or undoing the partition itself we in india uh, feel hesitant to say something like that for two reasons one the hindu right wing for last 100 years have been talking about a khand bharat unpartitioned india you know although they have been instrumental they have been equal participant in creating of two nation theory it is two nation theory was not creation of um uh, um islam based fundamentalism it was equally a creation of hindu fundamentalism or hindu right wing uh so no matter what they talk about akhand bharat you know they are dividers of the you know partitioners of the um, subcontinent so we hesitate many of us hesitate to talk about undoing the partition or its consequences because the hindu right wing talks about it especially in the current climate in india the second hesitation um more importantly is because three four generations have lived in three countries and people especially people in pakistan and in bangladesh any talk of undoing partition may sound to them wiping out independent sovereign countries from the map that is not the only way to unite that is not the only way to undo partition but that's the sense that can easily be carried that look i mean this big country india is or some people in this big country in india are talking about unification which means pakistan and bangladesh will no longer exist you know so that also makes progressives liberals leftist hesitant in talking about you know despite partition being such a disaster uh, we are hesitant to talk about undoing effects of partition if not partition itself so what is the way future you see what should we 
the, the people of India who have suffered so much because of this Hindu-Muslim divide, whatever may have been the causes, you were saying, and the role of underlining the role of colonialism. I mean, here in Professor Thapar, for example, Romila Thapar often points out, you know, James Mill's history and how, you know, the, the colonialism and British created, you know, um, uh, this Hindu-Muslim divide. I see that, I mean, who am I to, you know, not trust, you know, great historians like, you know, Romila Thapar, but it remains in my mind that such a deep divide, which can be triggered to such violence that happened at the time of partition, can that be created, you know, uh, just by political agency, you know, I mean, I, I have a lit little bit of doubt remains, but whatever may be the, the cause of partition, partition happened, it was a disaster. We all have suffered on all sides of the borders. How do you see the future for the subcontinent? So uh, sorry for taking time. Uh, and that is where I will leave and I would like to uh, have your comments. Thank you, Ravi. You've been very generous to me. Uh, just a quick response to your questions. Look, undoing partition is impossible. There are now three nation states, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. They have borders that are internationally recognized. Between Pakistan and India, there's not only a border, but a border that is reinforced with nuclear weapons, as well as conventional weapons. There would be massive, massive bloodletting. Perhaps a nuclear war which would end life on this subcontinent for a very long time to come. So we should not even think of unification as elimination of these borders. Instead, what we should think of are healthy relations, trade, allowing people to go across, tourism, and in this manner, cause tensions to decrease. Now, unfortunately, the uh, the Pakistan army has as its raison d'etre the maintenance of a permanent enemy. However, this army is also beginning to realize that Pakistan is now running, has been run to the ground so far as the economy goes, and that it is likely to collapse in the years ahead. And so it can be, I think, persuaded to to change its attitudes in this regard. And so the goal of us progressives should be to work towards better India-Pakistan relations, not to eliminate borders. I'll stop here because there are a lot of questions. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot many questions in the chat box, but first we would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Patnaik to share his views and share his comments. Professor Patnaik, uh, please. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have very much to say. But with regards to the last issue that was being discussed uh, between Ravi and Pervez, uh, I would just like to suggest that one way that we could move is for there to be, let's say, a common market involving these three countries where you have a common external tariff, but no internal tariffs freedom of the population to move from one side to another, as you have in the European community. You cannot have a common market where you actually have restrictions on people's movements, because then one region might actually remain underdeveloped. And because of this common market, their industry would disappear, but then people unemployed, they can't move elsewhere. So you should have freedom of movement. I'm not saying immediately, not tomorrow, but I think we could move towards a situation where the countries remain. We, I'm not thinking in terms of a European Union kind of thing, but like the European common market, the countries remain, sovereignty remains in inhering in the particular countries. But on the other hand, you have uh, free movements of goods and services and also of people, which we can aim towards. That's all I want to say. I would completely agree with that. And just add on to that, that uh, Kashmir, in of course, that issue has no resolution. It will not be resolved in our lives and probably not in the lives of our children as well. But if there is to be a solution, it has to be softening of the LOC. It has to be that Kashmiris should be allowed to cross over, that there be trade. And as 
you said over there, um, let things work themselves out peacefully. Uh, then uh, Kumar Ketkar Sahib is here. Uh, uh, I would invite him for uh, saying, he is, uh, saying his, uh, sharing his question and comment. Kumar Sahib. Yeah, what am I? Uh, yeah. You're, you're audible. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much for giving a very candid and eloquent observation on origin of Pakistan and the idea of Pakistan, whatever it is. While Stephen Cohen provides more kind of a logical argument of idea of Pakistan than even perhaps uh, Jinnaji may have. But the question that I have is, for the last 75 years, Pakistan, the idea of Pakistan got sustained to a great extent till 1971 when Islam could not keep the country together and Bangladesh was formed. How could that happen? That is one. And second, without the Cold War and the balance of power between 1945 after Second World War till today, would Pakistan survive? I Don't you think that Cold War actually created conditions for Pakistan to survive later. Creation of Pakistan, formation of Pakistan is all right, but survival of Pakistan as a separate state, despite becoming a very weak economy, is entirely because of the Cold War balance of power politics. And uh, without that, perhaps things would have been different. Thank you, Professor Kumar. I think uh, you're absolutely right. 1971 was a turning point. And when Indira Gandhi said that the two-nation theory has been swept into the Bay of Bengal, well, she was, uh, I think, spot on. It, it proved that religion cannot be a glue that is strong enough to hold a country together. And this is true even today. Today, we have movements in Balochistan movements among the Pathans as well. And now what's very interesting, by the way, is uh, after the Afghan Taliban have taken over Kabul, that um, the, the terrorist uh, Tariq Taliban Pakistan has become very active. And it is now raising the question of why the Durand line exists. Now, uh, if the two nation theory is to have all the Muslims of the subcontinent together, then what does Pakistan have to say about Afghanistan and about the legitimacy of the Durand line? So this problem after problem. And so that is why the two nation theory needs to be given a proper burial. Uh, of course, I uh, can't say that um, on national television over here because I'll you know what might happen. But I can tell you, and uh, I'm happy to repeat this um, wherever there are reasonable people, that the two-nation theory is dead. It should be buried. Your other point that Pakistan could not sustain itself economically uh, without the Cold War, that's absolutely true as well. The big bonanza came, of course, in with Ayub Khan. He was able to successfully exploit America's need to confront Soviet Russia, and so we became America's most allied ally, according to John Foster Dulles, then the Secretary of Defense. And uh, our good luck stayed on um, and was enhanced in 1979 when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Now, we know that Pakistan gained substantially from that. It enabled the, the Pakistani establishment to strengthen itself, to control the whole country. And then we also know what happened after 9-11. That was another lease of life given to the establishment. But now that has disappeared with the fall of Afghanistan. And... Uh, now Pakistan's rental value has gone down. So that's why there is a big, big crisis. And as people look ahead, uh, the future doesn't look good at all. However, who knows, things can change again. For example, there might be a war between India and China. And so then Pakistan's rental value will go up again. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a good thing to look forward to. But yeah, the, the, the 
Pakistani establishment is hoping for some windfall, some miracle to happen. Whether it happens or not, I don't know. One small, small interjection is allowed. Please, Kumar Saab. Yeah, very small interjection. 1979 saw the Soviets entering Afghanistan. 1979 also saw, saw Iranian revolution. 1979 also saw Bhutto's hanging in Pakistan. 1979 also saw the collapse of Janta Party in India. And 1979 also saw the beginning of Reaganism in America and Thatcherism in England. All that have contributed to the crisis of South Asia and that actually helped and strengthened Pakistan and in fact further divided India and Pakistan it, between Hindus and Muslims as majority of the Hindus, not only the communal ones, even non-communal Hindus look at Muslims in India as extension of Pakistan in India which may not be true because of my experience in Pakistan, every time I visited, four times I visited, they were more hospitable, they were less communal, and they were not talking about Hindu-Muslim. But in India, it is impossible to talk with a Hindu without having Muslim and Pakistan as eternal enemies. So the communalism is less in Pakistan by my personal experience and more in India. I don't want to blame this or that point, but the issue is 79 actually was a cutoff point for global history and for India and Pakistan. Actually, uh, it's remarkable that uh, Indians should think so because Pakistanis have forgotten about Muslims in India. Only when they want to bash India as a whole, you know, want to bash uh, Modi, then that thing comes about. But otherwise, we couldn't care less about what is happening to Muslims in India. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Professor Pavel, uh, for this uh, a very, very illuminating lecture, very, very thought-provoking lecture. I, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Rudran Singh, who has raised his hand for quite some time. Please make your comments. Raise your question. Well, it was a treat to listen to Dr. Parvez and uh, I have a few brief comments to make. That uh, Pakistan, unfortunately, is a nation state which has been absconding from democracy. And currently, India is being ruled by a dispensation which has a habit, rather it has an upbringing to abscond from democracy. And after the Second World War, since we haven't had a major crisis, so democracy world over is losing its sheen and charm. And the right wing is on the rise in the whole world. We, we are obsessed with strong leaders. We need an iron lady, iron man, X, Y, Z. We, don't, we have forgotten the congenial and sensible leaders. And the first casualty is education. The right wing hates education. And uh, Professor Saab rightly said that Pakistani universities are trash and the BJP is trying its level best to trash the Indian universities because they hate knowledge. That's all I had to say. And thank you. And my question would be that uh, both Indians and Pakistanis hate each other and hate each other vigorously. But we have many more reasons to hate Britain than we have to hate each other. Your comment, Professor Saab, on that. Ah, you see, um, uh, Pakistanis don't hate Britain. They uh, didn't, well, M Muslims did not fight against the British very much. They fought against Hindus. There is a difference in that regard. And so anti-colonialism is something that is not reflected in our textbooks, for example. Yeah, it's... Why is that so, sir? That is my question. Why is that so? Because the threat perceived by Muslims was, uh, was from Hindus and they saw the British as mediators. So it was a minority community that saw the British essentially as protectors. Uh, this is why uh, uh, the, the commander-in-chief of the 
Pakistan Army was uh, General Gracie, appointed by Jinnah, and um, it's this is also the reason why we do not uh, take have among any of our heroes those who fought against the British. So this this is the way it happened. I'm I'm just putting the facts before you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I invite uh, uh, Supla Sen Saab to make his comments. <coughs> thanks. Uh, my sincerest thanks to Professor Hoodboy for his brilliant presentation. Highly scholarly, amazingly courageous. Courageous in so many ways. I won't get into that. And also extremely insightful. It's just not scholarly, it's insightful. Anyway, having said that, coming back to Congress and its, its advocacy for a centralized state goes to the fact that they knew that ancient Indian nationhood is just a myth. It's a myth created partly by the Indian national movement itself in order to construct a nation. In order to construct a nation, they required a myth that the Indian nation was always there and blah, blah, blah. It was so great and this and that. Only difference between Indian nationalism and Hindu nationalism and Muslim nationalism, the Indian nationalism glorified Indian past from the ancient days till British arrival. Hindus, Hindu nationalism did it till Muslim arrival. And Muslim nationalism did only Muslim period. That's the difference. Doing that, and Indian leaders were also uh, aware that the national, nation, nationalist movement cannot complete the task of nation building. It has to be taken ahead by the new emerging state. It requires a centralized state because there are so much of centrifugal forces working. And religion is not just the only one. Eth Ethno-linguistic identities were also pretty important. Congress was committed to linguistic states, but they tried to sabotage it in very many ways, in very many states. Anyway, I'm good getting to the detail. The point is this, the, their insistence on a centralized state is because they visualize that India would not survive without a centralized state. It would fall apart along its natural uh, uh, rifts. Thanks a lot for your comments, please. Sir, I'm grateful to you for your comments and your spot on. However, I would say that India has managed to deal with, uh, with the uh, problem of disintegration much better than Pakistan. It was not just East Pakistan, Bangladesh, which was a problem for Pakistan, but also at the present time, because we refuse to learn lessons from the past, and because we insist that religion should be the reason for Pakistan to stay together, therefore, Pakistani leaders refuse to acknowledge regional identities. There is only one national language, which is Urdu. English is fading out, by the way. And we give no support to any of the regional languages. And this has uh, created a sense of alienation, which over time has just grown. We see this in Balochistan most particularly, but we also seeing this in Gilgit Baltistan and also in Sindh. It is only Punjab. Punjab is the heartland of, of Pakistan that is satisfied with things as they exist at the moment. So thank you for your comments. So nice of you. So, uh, <clears throat> Professor Parvi, let us uh, look at the chat box. There are many questions there, and most of the questions are uh, related to your first point about the emergence of two nation theory and who is responsible for that and all that. And many questions are related to that. I now read uh, one question. 
is uh, fanning separatism uh, warrant Ashraf Muslims and upper caste Hindus. More responsible for fanning separatism along with high caste Hindus. Did they use other Hindu and Muslims to create and fan communal disharmony? Uh, and also related to that, another question uh, came that um, Savarkar, who first uh, enunciated this uh, donation theory before Jinnah actually did. So how do you see that? Yes, uh, the Ashrafia, the Ashraf Muslims who were the upper class Muslims of uh, Uttar Pradesh, it is they who uh, saw themselves as descendants of the Mughals and saw themselves as the rightful rulers of India. And it is they who conceived of, uh, of their true land as not being UP, but of being Pakistan. And of course, they are the people who became the Mohajirs and they're the people who also regretted it and are regretting it. I won't say all of them, but a lot of them, because uh, now that their fortunes have not uh, uh, um, been according to their expectation, uh, they, are, they are aware of the fact that they have been taken for a ride. At least people like Altaf Hussain, who heads the Mahajir Qaumi Mahas. He's out now, he's in disgrace, but this is something that he used to articulate. And so, yes, I would say the movement for Pakistan owes very much to the upper echelons of Muslim society, the Ashrafia. And this is exactly what Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan belonged to. They were very dismissive of uh, ordinary Muslims. Forget Hindus, even ordinary Muslims, they did not consider to be humans and, uh, and, and Bengalis, by the way. Um, the UP types look down upon Bengalis as if uh, they were, even if they are Muslims, they're second class Muslims. On the issue of Savarkar, absolutely, I think it was 1923 that he wrote his, uh, his tract in which he said uh, there are, he was, he put the idea of two nation theory very clearly and it's uh, 17 years later that Jinnah was echoing him. Now, what's very interesting, I find, is that Savarkar was, was a kind of atheist. He didn't really believe, he didn't believe in Hinduism at all. Just like Jinnah had no clue about what Islam was and wasn't interested in finding out. And so all he could do was repeat uh, truisms like Islam is, knows everything, everything can be found there and so forth. But there's not one example where he could actually repeat a hadith. And he didn't know any Islamic language, forget Arabic. He didn't even know Urdu. He didn't even know Gujarati. He couldn't even speak to his sister in Gujarati. So that's, those are the paradoxes of history. Yes, so uh, the short of it is Savarkar was, and then Golvarkar later. Uh, so some friends have raised their hand, but before calling them, I would like to invite Vinod Mumbai. Uh, he's there with us. Vinod, please. You are mute. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be with oldest friend Parvez, who Ravi has already related. We were together in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the late 70s and uh, knew each other. I would like to just comment on one aspect. I was born in Lahore, and so I consider, have always considered Lahore as Vatan for one reason. I was in first grade, uh, six years old, first grade in school in Lahore when this partition happened. And I remember uh, talking about my grandfather, who was very unwilling to leave 
uh, Lahore and didn't understand, he said to his neighbor who belonged to the one of the ruling families of Punjab, the the Tiwana family, which was a, you know, one of their uh, people had been chief minister of Punjab in the old days in the unionist party and so on. So those were our neighbors. He was handing the keys of his house. And he said, Raja badalte hai, praja to nahi badalti. I mean, awam to nahi badalta, raja badalte hai. He couldn't understand what was going on. And I think this was a confusion that uh, probably affected many people uh, of his age. He was already in his late 70s who couldn't quite understand why they would have to leave this place where they had been born and lived their whole lives uh, as this partition happened. So. I would just like to comment on going forward, which is uh, the one of the themes that came up. What do we do going forward, acknowledging that these borders exist, nuclear weapons exist, all this other uh, propaganda and nonsense exists. So I think the faith has to be in the people at one level or the other. Europe went through devastating wars before they could forge a common market. Uh, now the devastating wars are not possible because of the nuclear uh, issue. So somehow people to people, we see that uh, every time anybody goes to across the borders, generally they receive warm welcomes by the people. So we have to uh, somehow invent a regime where there is trade, where there is uh, uh, open access across borders and so on, that this is the only way that the future, it may not happen in my lifetime, especially, uh, you know, it's, uh, but I hope that if the region is to survive, this people to people interactions can take it in a positive direction. Thank you. Vinod, you know that I can't agree more with you. Absolutely every word that you said. And it's, you know, the, this sort of thing can't be done virtually either. Zoom is very nice, but you have to sit opposite each other and you have to have a drink before uh, things really start moving. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sir. And I would like to invite uh, Gaur Raja Sir to make his comments. Um, I have been to Pakistan again four times and have been received with lots of love and care. The worst thing that two nations, India and Pakistan, could do to a visitor. Uh, was much better in Pakistan as compared to what my relatives have experienced in India. The first thing that you, after landing into the country, is to go to a police station. Uh, this has to stop. This is completely uncivilized. The other thing that I wanted to say uh, after this beautiful lecture that you have given is that I salute your courage because you have been living in a country where uh, bullets fly very, very freely as compared to India. And therefore, your courage is really remarkable. And the kind of things that you have been saying today in India, we cannot probably even think of saying about India and its history. In my opinion, the generation that we were talking about, uh, who were separated from each other, who had love for each other, who shared languages and food and long history, that generation has gone in 70 years. 
they had a stake in friendship between the countries. I can't think, but one has to think and find and search uh, stakeholders of peace, harmony, and friendship between the two countries. I don't know here, it has been suggested that common market may create those stakeholders. But I think we have to continuously search for new stakeholders. It could be culture, which has been very, very cultural activities I'm talking about. The dance, the drama, the, 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 the singers coming from there to here, uh, we exchanging uh, uh, our films and poetry and whatever, uh, which has been continuously attacked in India. It has not happened in Pakistan. In, Indian artists have never been attacked in Pakistan. Indian writers have never been attacked in Pakistan. At the time when Pakistan is becoming a softer enemy towards any Indian going there, in India, the tendency to look at any Pakistani as enemy has been increasing. It's extremely unfortunate and very disturbing. But I think as intellectuals, and especially people uh, like you who are extremely courageous, should also talk about who could be the stakeholders of this peace and friendship. Thank you, Gohar. Wonderful comment. It's quite obvious, actually, who could be the stakeholders. Just let tourists go from here to there and there to here. And they will automatically pick up the similarities and the differences and see the value in being allowed to interact with other peoples. So let's not be disheartened by the fact that the barriers have risen, that we have these awful, these absolutely terrible displays of, of narcissistic chauvinism at uh, Vaga. I mean, watching, and, and particularly on the Indian side, I must say, uh, I've, I've seen the Pakistani side and the Indian side both, and the Indian side is five times larger now. So, but this will, this will go, it'll, it'll, it can fade away. And um, in the long term, in the long term, after all, this, this enmity cannot persist. If it does persist, then what you have is uh, ultimate destruction. And so if we avoid ultimate destruction, then peace will come. Aapke <laughs> uh, uh, before I invite those friends who have raised their hands, uh, Professor Uma Chakravarti is here with us. and I. I think she has been working on this issue for a long time. Uma, Umaji. Uh, Uma Chakravarti? Umaji? Oh, she's not, she's not, he's not there, I think. Uh, uh, Satya Paul. Satya Paul. Reji, thank you very much for this lecture. Ke liye. मेरे जहन में जो दो तीन सवाल आए थे वो बाद में थोड़ा सा टच हुए हैं लेकिन फिर भी उन पे थोड़ी सी और बात की जा सकती है एक सवाल मेरे जहन में ये था क्योंकि मैं खुद भी एक ऐसे परिवार से बिलोंग करता हूँ जो पार्टीशन के के वजह से या प्रूट होके इस तरफ आया और पाकिस्तान में भी ऐसे लोगों से इंटरेक्शन होता रहता है जो यहां से आपने अपना भी थोड़ा सा एक रेफरेंस दिया तो मेरा सवाल ये था कि ये जो पार्टीशन की वजह से ब्लड बात हुआ लोग अपरूट हुए कल्चरल इश्यूज पैदा हुए लैंग्वेज इश्यू पैदा हुए इकोनॉमिक इश्यू पैदा हुए और डीपर साइकोलॉजिकल इश्यू पैदा हुए और जो आज तक रिजॉल्व नहीं हो सके तो जो पाकिस्तान का आइडिया था व्हाट्स एवर शायद इस तरह से भी इसको डिफाइन करना या कहना सही नहीं होगा 
और उसके बाद में जो पाकिस्तान का इंटेलेक्चुअल डिस्कोर्स हुआ जिसके कि आप एक पार्ट है उसके अंदर ये एक्सपीरियंस ये डीपर साइकोलॉजिकल और कल्चरल एक्सपीरियंस ये क्या रोल अदा कर रहा है और आगे जाके कैसा रोल अदा करेगा मेरा दूसरा सवाल ये था कि जब भी चर्चा होती है हिंदुस्तान और पाकिस्तान की और उनके इश्यूज की या उनके उनके करीब आने की तो उस चर्चा में कम से कम इस नॉर्दर्न पार्ट जिसमें इंडिया भी है और पाकिस्तान भी है या कम से कम जितनी चर्चा हम यहाँ पे बैठे सुनते हैं मैं इस समय चंडीगढ़ पंजाब में बैठा हूं तो वहां पे बांग्लादेश उस चर्चा से बाहर हो इवन बांग्लादेश क्रिएशन से पहले भी वो बांग्लादेश जो पा, पाकिस्तान का पार्ट था तो चाहे हिस्टोरिकल रेफरेंसेस लेने हों और और चाहे लोग क्या सोचते थे पार्टीशन को लेके और तमाम तरह की बातें तो जो एक पूरी थ्योरी बनाई जाए थ्योराइजेशन किया जाए इसको तो उसके अंदर उसको भी बीच में तीसरी बात तीसरी बात जो मैं चंद लाइनों में खत्म करूंगा उसको और वो ये है कि जैसे अब हम हमने इस सबका फ्यूचर क्या होगा इंडिया और पाकिस्तान के रिलेशन का जब इस पे बात कर रहे हैं तो हम अब भी कहीं पुरानी जनरेशन को बीच में ला और इनफैक्ट यहाँ बैठी हुई भी बहुत से लोग जो है वो, 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 वो पुरानी जनरेशन के, के लोग होंगे तो जो यंगर जनरेशन है जो आज का नौजवान पाकिस्तानी है वो क्या है दरअसल क्योंकि आगे जाके उसने रोल अदा करना है और, और क्या उसकी उसकी अच्छे से हमने स्टडी किया और इसी तरीके से इंडिया का जो नौजवान है और आज उनका रंग हमें कुछ भी क्यों ना नजर आता हो लेकिन दस साल बाद क्या होगा इस तरह से वो सोचा जा सकता है उस सब के बारे में तो उसको उसको बीच में लाना चाहिए मुझे ऐसा लगता है जब हम फ्यूचर के बारे में सोचें थैंक यू जी मुख्तसर जवाब देता हूँ आपको जहाँ तक नफसियाती बात है हमने तो भूल ही लिया है कि इंडिया में मुसलमान रहते हैं तो हम उसके बारे में सोचते भी नहीं है कि क्या तकसीम के वक्त लोगों को तकलीफ पहुंची थी कि क्या गुजरी थी उनके ऊपर वो सब हमने माजी में दफा कर दिया है उसे हम भूलना चाहते हैं भूल गए हैं जो आपने मशक़ी पाकिस्तान की बात की जो बाद में बांग्लादेश हुआ याद रहे कि पाकिस्तान का मुतालबा सबसे पहले मशक़ी पाकिस्तान में बुलंद हुआ था मुस्लिम लीग की बुनियाद वहाँ पर बनी थी लेकिन जब पाकिस्तान असल में बन गया तो उस वक्त बंगालियों को ये एहसास हो गया कि ये कोई बराबरी का रिश्ता नहीं है मुझे तो याद है कि हम स्कूल में मैं कराची में पला बढ़ा तो हमारे स्कूल में जो बंगाली बच्चे थे उनको तो हम ऐसी हकारत की नज़रों से देखते हैं कि कोई कमतर लोग हैं और जब वो हमसे अलहदा हो गए इकहत्तर में तो पाकिस्तान में कोई इस पर ज़्यादा अफसोस नहीं हुआ हाँ जो गुस्सा था वो सारा गुस्सा इंडिया पे था कि इंडिया ने पाकिस्तान को तोड़ा है लेकिन ये कोई ख्वाहिश नहीं थी कि दोबारा जुड़ जाएं बंगाल के साथ बांग्लादेश के साथ और जो आपका जो तीसरा सवाल है कि पाकिस्तान का नौजवान क्या सोचता है क्या इंडिया के बारे में उसमें तो जहर भरा जाता है ये तो हमारे स्कूलों के अंदर है हमारे तालीमी निसाब के अंदर है हेट इंडिया लेकिन इससे बहुत से नौजवान निकल आए हैं उनको पता है कि इंडिया बहुत तेज़ी से आगे निकल रहा है पाकिस्तान बहुत तेज़ी से पीछे जा रहा है और कि इधर हालात ठीक नहीं है तो अब ये हमारे लिए बहुत बड़ा चैलेंज है कि उस नौजवान तक पहुंचा जाए जो अब भी सोचने समझने की सलाहियत रखता है थैंक यू सर उमा चक्रवर्ती हाँ जी ओके लेट मी जस्ट आई वाज नॉट एक्सपेक्टिंग टू स्पीक बट 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 इसी पॉइंट से अगर हम पिकअप कर लें सिंपली 
एक चीज आई थिंक हमको याद रखने की जरूरत है कि वेन वी टॉक ऑफ दीज टू नेशन स्टेट वी एग्रीगेटेड एज द डोमिनेंट वॉइसिस आई थिंक वी शुड ऑल्सो कंसिडर की वॉट हैव बीन दटेम्प्ट टू ब्रिज दिस डिवाइड एंड वॉट हैज बीन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ वीमेन एंड द वीमेन्स मूवमेंट इन हैंडलिंग द um the this uh, serious divide and i'll really go back to this question that was asked of bangladesh um in uh, 19 in 2001 lahore in the institute of women studies lahore where i used to go and teach sometimes um there was a conference that was held it was designed, it was 30 years since bangladesh the bangladesh uh, war and it was extraordinary for the fact that <clears throat> Uh, people had come from all over south asia it was a south asian feminist conference the women from bangladesh who had also come <clears throat> this included amina mohsin who was in lahore at the time when partition uh, when the partition uh, when the 71 war happened her father was posted uh, in the undivided <clears throat> pakistan army he was posted in lahore and while he was while she took her exam then they were interned and she took her exams from the <clears throat> from a cantonment from an uh, from the from a camp she used to be driven by security people took took her exams and she would come back so she uh, was um, she has been among the activists in bangladesh <clears throat> who has um, who has taken over on the uh, the hard nationality question and been very critical of it so she she worked on chitagong and uh so on so if you look at the history of the women's movement particularly its vocal sec- sections i will not forget that at that conference uh, tahira mazhar ali who was um, uh, at the conference got up and spoke about how they stood up she and some women uh, went on a demonstration as the war uh, as the assault on uh, bangladesh was beginning and they would obviously there was a lot of anger against them and so on but they stood their ground they actually was a demonstration of 100 women opposing the military action in uh, in uh, pakistan and 30 years later that conference actually had a resolution which demanded the apology uh, by the milit- uh, by the army for the atrocities that had committed in bangladesh now i can't imagine that hamare desh mein india mein hum kabhi kisi se maafi mangwa le but wo unhone kiya tha so it was actually quite extraordinary so i think when we tell these when we tell the story uh, or tell the history of partition and whatever it is uh, it's useful to also look at what happens uh, to s- select communities i mean vinod has already spoken about his own experience but it is important to look at how people respond to that moment and what it what impact that has left and how people have also resisted it so crossing borders and looking for um ways in which we can actually be south asian rather than so narrowly confined to our own um into into our own nation states is is a challenge that we will have to uh, face and it is something that we can't give up on matlab der hoga lekin chhodna nahi chahiye wo agenda ko humko chhodna nahi chahiye and i'll only end with that i also was born before partition and i think i'm the same age as vinod uh, i was also perhaps in class 1 when this when partition happened well thank you very much that's that's a very appropriate comment and i have great admiration for the women who who stood up against the uh, the uh, regime at that time 50 years ago today the women's movement is preoccupied with uh, fighting for women's rights within pakistan the the extreme misogynistic culture that we have the spate of murders that uh we see across the country that go unpunished and so forth so there's very little attention being given to um meeting up with women from other side of the border but certainly one hopes that the women's movement will grow stronger on both sides and that would be then a bridge for peace yeah Thank you for it will be and i'm sure there will be and i'll just close with the fact that um we need to also understand that we share south asian patriarchies across the board so we actually we have a common agenda in that sense of the term and yeah but we we have it worse we have it worse than you uh, <laughs> give and take that, that's a matter of scale i think we've got yeah. a pretty hard patriarchy 
uh, across South Asia, and we have to battle that. Uh, okay. So there is there is some uh, reason for coming together uh, on that that note also. Uh, thank you very much for <laughs> for asking me to comment. <clears throat> Uh, Professor Parvati, there are uh, I'm now I'm taking two questions from chat box. They are somewhat related to your first point of uh, uh, how come this donation theory became reality uh, uh, related to that point. One from Niranjan Pant, another point from uh, Bokhar Star. <laughs> Did communal undertones of Gandhi and some of the main Congress leaders and their sideline of Dinna also responsible? for conversion of Jinnah from a modern progressive Indian to a communal Islamist? That's the question posed by Niranjan Pant. And Vakhar Sahib asked this question uh, regarding Khilafat movement. Was it appropriate for Indian Muslims to join it and later by Mahatma Gandhi as it eventually led to the backfire from Hindu extremist groups? These are the two questions. Yeah. Um, on the Khilafat movement, I think... Uh, it was a bad idea to re revive the Khilafat. It didn't work in any case. This was something that had failed in Turkey and failed over a long period of time for uh, Muslims to have gotten into this. And uh, hope for pan-Islamism to triumph was, uh, was something that was not historically sustainable either. The revolts against caliphs historically had been over hundreds of years. For, Jinnah, for, for Gandhi to have joined the Khilafat movement and to have become an important leader of it, in my opinion, was a mistake. He uh, therefore introduced religion into politics, but of course he did it with the hope that this would unify resistance against the British. Well, the British did have to be fought against, no doubt about that. But there are ways of fighting them and there are ways of not fighting them. And I don't think that this was the proper way through religion, joining Muslims and Hindus together in a battle for, for reviving a dead institution. And it didn't work. We are with us, uh, Subrat Raju. Uh, like to comment, ask him to comment. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Parvez, for that uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, talk. And thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, I had a couple of comments. Uh, one of them actually is a speculation about the parallel universe. It's only a speculation. We can only dream. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you said that uh, in Pakistan, the rise of Modi is used as a justification for the two nation theory. In fact, in a parallel universe where partition had not happened, I think someone like Modi would never have arisen because, uh, you know, Hindu fundamentalism, of course, takes, you know, it's arisen in a particular uh, majoritarian setup, which takes advantage of the fact that they can completely ignore about what is now about 13 or 15 percent of India's population. And perhaps if, you know, the population had been more diverse as it was before you know, before partition, it would have been a check both on Hindu and Muslim fundamentalism. But I mean, that's just a speculation. So I often feel that, you know, it's it's what tells us why the two nation theory was wrong. But uh, uh, okay. uh, the other issue I wanted to mention is in terms of going forward. And that there is, a, I think there's a question of what the unifying glue can be. And uh, I would uh, contend that one of the things that I think can unify us in a political narrative is uh, the question of what used to be called, you know, third world solidarity. And I think that is a very important uh, narrative because, you know, it is, it's, it's a question of where our interests in terms of India and Pakistan uh, align. Uh, of course, there is issues of tourism and softening the LOC and so on. But I think this is where, you know, broadly our interests align. And in fact, in this, I would think that uh, perhaps it is in India that the political consciousness is lacking. Uh, in Pakistan, you mentioned that in textbooks, you know, anti-colonialism is not taught, and in India, it is taught. Uh, but in fact, in Pakistan, there is clearly a, a deep suspicion of uh, the manipulations of uh, the United States and dominant uh, Western countries. And it's it's very correct, because it's true that Pakistan has suffered by having a high rental value. So I would think that fundamentalism, you know, fundamentally that Suspicion, even if it comes with, you know, religious overtones and so on that I understand you would be uncomfortable with and many other political issues is correct because 
I would agree that the major threat, you know, to the world is a declining empire, uh, you know, trying to preserve its hegemony and willing to do whatever it takes to preserve its its hegemony, which is, you know, which is what we see today. And in fact, in India, uh, you said Pakistan's rental value has gone down, but India's rental value has gone up because, you know, the United States as a declining empire sees China as its primary threat. And this, you know, there are tensions between India and China, which are natural, but the United States is clearly not playing a constructive role and is attempting to use India in the same way that it used Pakistan. And uh, that would be a terrible error. And in fact, it is there that the Indian uh, political consciousness uh, is lacking, I think, and needs to be developed. This, you know, very justified suspicion of the intentions uh, of the United States, that I think is available in Pakistan. And in fact, I think, you know, just to say one more thing, on so many questions, the most, some of the most important questions confronting civilization, such as the question of climate change, which you know we are seeing the effects both in Pakistan and India, our interests do align. And this is where the, the line is. This is the interests of developing countries against the advanced capitalist countries. That is where the objective interests are. And that is the only way these issues can be resolved. And so I would propose that that is something that you know uh, we should put forward as a way of politically you know, unifying, um, you know, unifying India and Pakistan, it could be uh, possibly, a, you know, potentially a gluing factor. Thank you, Sovrat. You know, to respond satisfactorily would take a long time. But and as far as the little uh, comment that I made on parallel universes, you know that inflation theory is suspect. Okay, <laughs> but never mind. We let that go. In a parallel universe, okay, um, we may not have had partition, but uh, in a closely parallel world, we would still have had Hindu-Muslim differences. That they grew exponentially and got out of control is because of the conscious manipulations of politicians. Even more than the British, it was the, the politicians of the Muslim League who were responsible for that. So I, I would put the primary blame on them. You have, you are drawing a parallel between India and Pakistan now. You're saying we're both third world. Well, third world was, yeah, I guess it's, it, it was an appropriate term to use 50 years ago. Not anymore. Now India has gone way, way ahead of Pakistan. And I wouldn't quite agree with you that the United States is using India in the same way that it used Pakistan. Pakistan didn't have strength on its own. India does have strength on its own. And that gives it more um, ways in which to deal with the United States. I would completely agree with you that there are common challenges, climate change in particular, that need coordinated uh, efforts on part of uh, all countries in the world and particularly of South Asia and that means Bangladesh first of all, Pakistan and India in that order. As you can see Pakistan is still devastated, it's in a state of devastation right now. So yeah, we've got to work together on that. But let's not uh, get into false equivalences. I think India is now way ahead of Pakistan. Abdul Kadir Sahib has raised his hand, so uh, I will ask him to please raise your question. Ask your question. Abdul, Abdul Mukaddir Sahib. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my question is to Parvez Sahib. There are two questions. One is about the past and the uh, second one is about the future. The past question is regarding China. What he know that in 1930, he was disgusted and left to uh, England uh, after I probably feel that he left because he, he felt that he would remain underdog to Gandhi. So he went to England and then lived there for a couple of years. And before that, he was working for the unity of Hindu Muslim. And there was no not much about two nation theory or making of Pakistan and all that nonsense. Afterwards, when he came back, 
he was very aggressive and started working towards the two nation theory and discrimination between Hindu and Muslims. So the question is, has anybody investigated within those uh, dormant years of his living in, was he pampered by the British? Because they were very expert in creating uh, the division between Hindu Muslim to continue the rule. And maybe that's one thing. So that was question number one uh, regarding the past. The, regarding the future, uh, I, I am from Pakistan since 40 years. I'm living in the United States now, but I've been keeping a very close eye. I have attended uh, your other seminars and I understand uh, where you are coming from. But one thing I, I want to uh, bring uh, here is that Pakistan has been teaching false history to the students. I mean, there is a book, very nice book written by K.K. Aziz, which is titled as The Murder of History in Textbooks of Pakistan. So, I mean, where the lies and lies have been told, he has, he has clearly discussed on that. So with that type of, even today, if you go to seven, eight, nine, even 12th grade student uh, and ask them about East Pakistan, they probably don't know because they don't teach it. And in fact, at one time, the 16th December was becoming a pain, a thorn in their uh, side. So <laughs> coincidentally, and I would like to say very suspicious that the Peshawar school incident happens exactly on the 16th. And since then, nobody talks about the, the surrender and the, and the defeat of Pakistani army. And everybody cries about the Peshawar school children. So that's another thing. That's the type of games and tricks have been played on. So how do you expect a future of gentlemen or boys or girls of Pakistan to, to, to bring, the, to learn the, because here in the United States, even those people are here, immigrated like me, when I try to talk to them in, in our private parties and everything, I'm considered as an enemy of Pakistan. I'm, I'm talking about the enemy of army, whatever. So I don't care. I keep on telling them. So what's your comment on these two uh, questions, sir? Ji, Mukhtar Sahib, I think you were absolutely Mukhtadir. right. That yeah. Mukhtadar, Mukhtadar, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, jo, jo, uh, jo, jo, uh, jo, uh, wala <laughs> so um what made Jinnah change as you very correctly said he returned in 1930 and earlier he was um, an author of the lucknow pact he was a person who um, certainly did not harbor any animosity towards hindus in fact you see in all his speeches, and in none of his speeches, do you see um, hatred for the for the Hindu religion? And yet, he kept insisting on this two nation theory. Why did he do that? And when did he do that? I think I can put a finger on that. That's 1937, the defeat that the Muslim League faced at that time. After which he swore that now the Muslim League is going to use Islam as its rallying cry. And he said, we don't have to be apologetic in that. This is the way things are. And so from 1937 to 1940, that's uh, when he made that speech, and then onwards to 1947, <coughs> or just a little bit before that, he was frankly, openly and outrightly communalist. Hindus and Muslims cannot live together. Muslims have, uh, they can, they are a nation by themselves. They are joined together by bonds of faith, etc. So that's, um, I think, in response to that history question. As far as Bangladesh being taught to or East, the fall of East Pakistan being not taught to Pakistani students. You're absolutely right on that. History has been murdered, as KK Aziz said. Uh, kids in Pakistan are just told that this was a Hindu conspiracy, an Indian conspiracy to break off East Pakistan, and they succeeded. And so this becomes a kind of national grudge. And that's why on the 16th of December, uh, we talk of uh, the army public school massacre, but not the fall of 
of uh, East Pakistan. Yeah, this uh, this is an yeah this is an no, this is what, deliberately what was, induced amnesia. No, no. What I was trying to bring also was that when the Pakistani army attacked uh, Bangladesh on twenty third uh, March uh, nineteen seventy one to suppress their protests. Uh, there was no war with India. India was not involved in, at all. And so they tired, they got tired with uh, the nine month of struggle going on and fight going on. So it, to me, it appears that they wanted to accelerate and then blame India. So on the 3rd December 1971, uh, under the code name Changes Khan, uh, the uh, Pakistan Air Force invaded India 11 air bases to invite India to, to, to summarize the surrender and then take the blame of separating pa and breaking Pakistan. Okay, right. So we can now move to the next question because we are basically in agreement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, so Professor Prabhupada, uh, there is a question from Mr. Khaizer Nakhvi. Uh, he has raised his impression is, uh, Pakistan lacked democracy from the beginning, while India always enjoyed democracy. But the glaring fact that both countries faced rise of fundamentalism and uh, Modi's strength and public support is getting is a living example. How do you see this? I'm sorry, I didn't uh, get the full question. Can you repeat it? Yeah, uh, I'll do, certainly. Khaizar uh, Nekvi is asking, Pakistan lacked democracy uh, from the beginning, while India always enjoyed democracy, but the glaring fact that both the countries faced rise of fundamentalists, Modi's strength and public support is uh, now he is getting the living example. How do you see that? Yeah, well, fundamentalism raised its head much sooner in Pakistan than in India, and we had the anti Qadiani riots in 1952 that left about 2,000 Ahmadis dead. And uh, then um, we, from time to time, we have seen anti-Shia riots, especially during Muharram processions. India uh, today is seeing this wave of anti-Muslimism, but um, I think the treatment of Hindus in Pakistan has been much worse as compared to the treatment of Muslims in India. And uh, this is really the reason why Pakistan has such a small and diminishing Hindu population. So we can't quite compare the two in this regard. As far as democracy goes, well, the major interruption in Pakistan has come from coups, from martial laws. And this, I think, I try to cover in talking about why Pakistan is a Praetorian state. And basically, the reason is that Pakistan was born without an idea, without competent leaders. After Jinnah's death, you have a, a scramble for power. And uh, Ayub Khan, when he took over, he said, that these are like nine cats with their tails tied together. I had to come in to tame the cats. So that has been repeated over and over again, four times, in fact. And so um, uh, it's, it's the army in Pakistan that has um, not allowed democracy to, to develop, even in situations where it might have been able to. I think that uh, um, interventions such as uh, what happened in 2018 significantly derailed Pakistani democracy and we are seeing the immediate impact of that today. Uh, Alok Tandon Saab has raised his hand uh, for some time. Uh, Alok Saab. Oh. Please, please brief. Be, be brief. Please. Very brief. Thank you very much. You have raised my hand from the जिज्ञासा थी कि क्यों पाकिस्तान की आर्मी ने पावर ग्रेप की और इतने समय तक चलती रही जबकि हिंदुस्तान में ऐसा नहीं हुआ इसके ऊपर जो रोशनी डाली उससे मैं बहुत ही लाभान्वित हुआ हूँ बहुत मुझे फायदा हुआ है लेकिन मेरा सवाल ये है कि टू नेशन थ्योरी सावरकर ने पहले दी 
लेकिन क्या वजह है कि वो भारत में रूट नहीं जमा पाई पार्टीशन तक फोर्टी सेवन तक और उसके बाद सत्तर सालों में हम देख रहे हैं कि वो और मजबूत होती जा रही थी तो इसके पीछे व्हाट इज द रीजन बिहाइंड और मेरा दूसरा छोटा सा सवाल ये है कि आप क्या देखते हैं कि पाकिस्तान में कोई नई पॉलिटिकल लीडरशिप पैदा हो रही है या जो प्रेजेंट पॉलिटिकल लीडरशिप है वो क्या ऐसी कैपेबल नहीं है कि वो पाकिस्तान को एक विजन दे सके और भारत पाकिस्तान के संबंधों में सुधार कर सके क्या वो केवल आर्मी के पीछे सिर्फ चलने वाली लीडरशिप आज भी है धन्यवाद जी जो पहला सवाल है शायद आप मुझे बेहतर समझा सकें लेकिन जो मेरी थोड़ी बहुत समझ है उसके बारे में वो ये कि कांग्रेस की जो लीडरशिप थी जिसमें नेहरू जैसे लोग थे लेकिन और बहुत से थे और जो बुनियादी तौर पर जदीद सोच रखते थे मॉडर्नस थे और उसमें अगर अगरचे फंडामेंटलिस ज़रूर कुछ थे लेकिन जैसा कि पटेल लेकिन आ, उनका असर इतना नहीं था और मैं समझता हूँ कि गांधी जी का भी बहुत इसमें बड़ा किरदार है उन्होंने जिस तरह से कोशिश की कि आरएसएस को इससे दूर रखा जाए और कि आगे का सोचा जाए हिंदू मुस्लिम शांति के बारे में सोचा जाए तो इस तरह से वो आर जो सवारकर और गोलवारकर जैसी सोच थी वो आगे बढ़ नहीं सकी दूसरी वजह ये है कि हिंदुओं के हालात मुसलमानों से बहुत बेहतर थे उनके पास अच्छी अच्छी नौकरियां थीं बड़े बड़े अहदों पर वो फायस थे और आप देखें कि तालीम के मैदान में और साइंस के मैदान में सी वी रामन को नोबेल प्राइज मिला था 1920s में पार्टीशन से 30 साल पहले तकरीबन मिला था तो एक इंडियन अपर मिडिल क्लास बनी थी जो पढ़ी लिखी थी ये चीज़ मुसलमानों में नहीं थी और मैं समझता हूँ कि जो जो इल्मी लिहाज से उनमें फ़र्क था यही वजह है कि आज इंडिया और पाकिस्तान में भी इतना बड़ा फ़र्क आ गया है जहाँ तक आगे की बात है मुस्तबिल की बात है क्या पाकिस्तान में कोई ऐसी सियासी क़वतें हैं जो इंडिया के साथ मफाहमत की तरफ ले जाए हाँ मैं समझता हूँ है आपको ये याद होगा कि नवाज शरीफ ने जो मोदी के साथ हाथ आगे बढ़ाया था मोदी बल्कि नवाज शरीफ के घर पहुंचे थे किसी शादी में शरीक होने के लिए और ये वो चीज़ें हैं जो पाकिस्तान की फ़ौज को बहुत बुरी लगी थी और जिसकी वजह से नवाज शरीफ को हटाया गया अब ये वजूहत तब्दील हो सकती हैं जैसा जैसा जैसे जैसे पाकिस्तान एक इकोनॉमिक कोलैप्स की तरफ जाता और आर्मी हमारी होश में आती है क्योंकि इंडिया के साथ हमेशा तक दुश्मनी कायम रखने के लिए आपको बहुत बड़े पैसे चाहिए और वो पैसे अब ख़त्म होते चले जा रहे हैं तो चलिए हम पुरुमीद हो सकते हैं आने वाले वक्तों के लिए वन मिनट क्या जो मैंने सवाल किया कि पार्टीशन के समय एक हिंदू पाकिस्तान नहीं बना लेकिन आज जो बन रहा है उसके पीछे आप क्या देखते हैं ये सत्तर सालों में जो ये रिवर्स गेयर हो गई है मॉडर्निटी के खिलाफ हम जा रहे हैं इसकी वजह क्या मुझे लगता है सवाल का जवाब अभी अधूरा है अच्छा तो उसमें आपने ये भी देखा कि कांग्रेस की नाकामी उसके अंदर जो करप्शन है जो नेहरू डायनेस्टी आ गई इसमें और जिसका किरदार अच्छा नहीं रहा तो मैं समझता हूँ कि बुनियादी तौर पर ये कांग्रेस की नाकामी थी और फिर देखें जब 
कम्युनल फोर्सेस पहले से मौजूद होती हैं किसी सोसाइटी के अंदर तो उस समाज में वो ताकतें हमेशा ये कोशिश करेंगी कि जो कम्युनिज्म की आग है उसको तेज किया जाए क्योंकि उससे उनकी अपनी ताकत बढ़ती है तो ये जो बाबरी मस्जिद का वाक़ था ये वो मौका फराम किया जिसके बाद फिर हम देखते हैं कि बीजेपी की ताकत बढ़ती चली गई और आज इस हद तक पहुंची है सुभाष अगर मैं एक मिनट के लिए इंटरव्यून करूं क्योंकि ये सवाल कंटेम्प्ररी पॉलिटिक्स पे और कांग्रेस पे आ गया है तो मैं ये नहीं चाहता कि आज जो माहौल हिंदुस्तान में है उसमें बात कांग्रेस को कांग्रेस की आलोचना पे खत्म हो ऑफ कोर्स आई एग्री विद परवेज की कांग्रेस की कमियां रही हैं और कांग्रेस में हम हमेशा देखते रहे हैं कि आधे तो आरएसएस टाइप लोग भी रहे हैं लेकिन आज ये ये देखना पड़ेगा हम लोग यहाँ ये अक्सर एनएसआई में और इस प्लेटफॉर्म पे बहस करते रहते हैं कि जो नेहरू किसी ने लिखा अभी शायद रुगांशु ने लिखा कि नेहरू वॉज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान नेहरू का जो विजन था जो पंडित परवेज ने भी बहुत ही ब्यूटीफुली अंडरलाइन किया नेहरू का विजन जो था वो आज के इंडिया के परवेज जितना इंडिया को अच्छा समझ रहे हैं मुझे तो आ, आ, उस पर पूरा एतबार नहीं है हम लोग भुगत रहे हैं इंडिया में जो हो रहा है उसको और इंडिया में अब मुसलमानों के साथ जो हो रहा है वो पाकिस्तान में हिंदुओं के साथ जो किया है उससे कोई जो कम बुरा नहीं है लेकिन फिर भी ये देखना पड़ेगा कि नेहरू के का विजन और नेहरू का पीरियड का डिक्लाइन क्यों हुआ और उसका दोष सिर्फ कांग्रेस पे नहीं दिया जा सकता हालांकि कांग्रेस का दोष स्पष्ट है कांग्रेस की कमियां स्पष्ट है लेकिन उसका दोष सिर्फ कांग्रेस पर नहीं दिया जा सकता हालात ऐसे थे कि देर सवेर हिंदू फंडामेंटलिज्म को सर उठाना था और वो सर उठाना तब हुआ जब कांग्रेस की जो एंटी कॉलोनियल नेशनल मूवमेंट की हेजमनी थी वो अनेक कारणों से जब डिक्लाइन पे गई तो उस हेजमनी के डिक्लाइन के बाद जब यहाँ पर इलेक्टोरल डेमोक्रेसी विगरस होती है कॉम्पिटिटिव होती है डेमोक्रेसी अच्छी चीज है और मेरे पास डेमोक्रेसी का कोई अल्टरनेटिव नहीं है और इसके बावजूद मैं ये कहने से अपने आप को रोक नहीं सकता कि इंडिया में जब इलेक्टोरल कॉम्पिटिटिव डेमोक्रेसी मजबूत होती है कॉम्पिटिटिव होती है तो ऐसे कॉम्पिटिटर्स पैदा होते हैं जो हिंदुस्तानी सोसाइटी स्पेशली हिंदू सोसाइटी के सोशल माइंड में जो तफरका जो डिवीजन पड़ा हुआ है जो 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 गलत बातें पड़ी हुई हैं उनको उभार करके वो सामने ले आती हैं तो एक तरह से एक तरह से कहा जाए कि परवेज अंडरलाइन कर रहे हैं अपने यहाँ के प्रॉब्लम्स को जो मिलिट्री है प्राइटोरियन स्टेट है वो और हमारे यहाँ जब डेमोक्रेसी और एक्टिव होती है तो पैराडॉक्सिकली हिंदू फंडामेंटलिज्म राइट विंग हिंदुत्व सर उठाता है इस ये इस पर भी हम लोगों को सोचना पड़ेगा हम जानते हैं कि डेमोक्रेसी का कोई विकल्प नहीं है कोई अल्टरनेटिव नहीं है लेकिन इस तरह की डेमोक्रेसी जैसी कि हमारे यहाँ हिंदुस्तान में है वो किस तरह से बैकवर्डनेस को बिगटरी को रिलीजोसिटी को डिवीजन को हेट और वायलेंस को आ, सामने ले आई है उस पर भी सोचने वालों को सोचना पड़ेगा इसलिए कांग्रेस पर जिम्मा डाल के हम न रुक जाएं दरअसल आज जो हिंदुस्तान में हो रहा है मैं तत्काल तो अभी तो आ, हिंदुस्तान से दूर बैठा हूँ लेकिन आ, जो भी सोशल मीडिया में दिखाई दे रहा है एक बुलंद आवाज जो इस रिजीम को चैलेंज कर रही है वो कांग्रेस से ही निकली है उ, उस, उस, उसका अपोजिशन कांग्रेस के अंदर भी है लेकिन जैसे घटाटोप में जैसे अंधेरे में वो आवाज करेज के साथ निकली है वो कांग्रेस से ही निकली है ठीक क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम Mr. Vinay Tiwari, he would like to know what kind of changes uh, recent China-Pakistan relations, especially its economic corridor, can bring in the economy of Pakistan, and also how it will affect this new relationship between these two countries will affect 
the relations with us india well pakistan has uh, thought that the china pakistan economic corridor called cpec will be a game changer and it has been uh, thrilled at the fact that there have been something like 62 billion dollars which have been put as uh, investment by china over the last several years it is however turning out not to be any kind of a game changer it's true that power plants electric power plants have been built it's true that roads have been built but uh, these have not uh, brought uh, any significant manufacturing capability to pakistan the economy has not expanded except in the service sector and the benefits that were talked about are not to be seen on the contrary now china is asking for return of loans given pakistan's great difficulty with uh, foreign exchange it is now trying to persuade china to defer those loans so uh, this and, and now actually politicians across the board are reluctantly so very reluctantly admitting that cpec has not brought the advertised prosperity how will china pakistan relations affect uh, pakistan india relations well um, china likes to keep out of directly influencing pakistan's politics and any effect is uh, indirect in this regard so i would say that um, although uh, there have been um, peace overtures between india and china and uh, some some efforts to uh, resolve the uh, what is in in the northern himalayas that has not featured that has not caused even a ripple in pakistan Uh, now I would like to uh, relay a question from Mr. Skeeter. He is he wants to know how far is the absence of an industrialist capitalist class, which is invested in the idea of modernity and secularism, responsible for the trajectory that Pakistan, unlike India, took. In this context, it is instructive that the Bombay plan was advocated by the captains of Indian industry well before 1947. Though Indian capitalism did accommodate the interests of Indian landlord class in the Indian politics of 1947. The Muslim industrial class was uh, quite minuscule in comparison to the Hindu uh, capitalist class, industrial capitalist class. And uh, of course, some Jinnah was able to persuade some um, uh, uh, capitalists to migrate from Bombay to Karachi but uh, and and they did set up industries over there and uh, I could say that until uh, 1968 70 72 3 Pakistan was industrializing at a fairly rapid pace um, this was of course uh, made possible because of american aid but it is a fact that the size of pakistan's industrial economy was growing but then i think a major uh, uh, impact was made by zulfiqar ali bhutto when he started nationalizing the industries so for example the biggest machine tool manufacturing complex in pakistan known as biko batala engineering company bhutto nationalized that and essentially crippled it bhutto nationalized a whole bunch of other industries in fact uh, his rhetoric was socialist 
Of course, it was just rhetoric. The common man didn't benefit from it. And very soon, uh, <coughs> all his promises failed, including that of land reform. But uh, I'd say that the fact that India had a big national uh, bourgeoisie, a Hindu national bourgeoisie, helped it become a much more developed um, industrial, uh, industrialized country relative to Pakistan. The other thing is the poor quality of Pakistani education. And uh, this has been very significant. This has been re re really the biggest impediment to Pakistan's growth in industry, in science, in academics. And I think please, one, please. one comment I may be permitted to make please, at this time uh, please. Uh, is that uh, Nehru and <coughs> Maulan Azad, who was the first education minister in the in the Indian government were responsible for the creation of the Indian Institutes of Technology, the famous IITs. And I think that role must be recognized and stressed of these two uh, individuals. Nehru, we have talked about, we've also talked about Molana Azad, who was a seminal thinker, but uh, also a, a believer in modernity and his creation of these engineering institutes laid the foundations for much of India's progress in later years in the education field. Thank you. Uh, uh, we know just one quick comment. I, I can't resist making it. I visited the Maulana Abul Kalam Azad Urdu University in Hyderabad, and I was absolutely appalled. It's oh, even yeah. worse. It's even worse than universities in Pakistan. I have never seen so many beards and burqas. And they were discussing things that, uh, uh, they were actually very angry with me when I praised Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan, because they consider him an, an apostate and a heretic. <laughs> and they say, what is the need to learn English, to learn science? We are great. And so that kind of thing, I'm afraid exists within the Muslim community in India. It exists in Pakistan, but I would have hoped that the Muslim community in India would have would have learned some things, but uh, at least that part has not. Of course, I do see Muslims who have moved ahead are, are uh, modern, scientifically minded, but uh, there are not enough of them. Yes, uh, I, yeah, I just please. very briefly comment. Uh, we don't, we don't, please, uh, we don't, please. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Please, can, you can you excuse me first. Uh, we are moving to the conclusion of this meeting, but before that, we, I would like to invite uh, Nazir Ahmed Saab uh, for his, because he has raised his comment. He has raised his hand. Nazir Ahmed Saab. A brilliant exposition, as usual, by Professor Hoodboy. My comment relates to the tension between majoritarianism and autonomy in the subcontinental context and the failure of either the intellectual elite or the political establishment to accommodate this tension. Now, it seems to me the right way to approach uh, the uh, a, a, an understanding of what happened historically and what is the situation today is to start bottoms up. India, the subcontinent, is a diverse society. How do we accommodate the diversity in a political structure? That question was never asked. What happened was we had this political elite who came from England imbibed with the ideas from England and 19th century ideas of nationalism, majoritarianism, minority, and so on. And ultimately it was imposed upon the subcontinent. 
If we look at the history of the development of uh, majoritarianism, India, Pakistan, from the census of 1871, 1872, the first partition of Bengal, then came the uh, Khilafat movement and the rise of uh, Hindu nationalism, and finally what happened in 1931, etc. It's, it's, it's a hilarious display of a failure to understand the fundamentals of Indian society and how people fail to ask the right questions. If you would please comment on that, Professor Saab. Well, developing an inclusive society is something that happens over a long period of time. It didn't happen in Europe until it saw the ravages of uh, the Second World War. Then you have the softening of borders, ultimately the European Union. But within those societies, well, if one is speaking of inclusivism, then, and if one is looking for models, I think that uh, perhaps there was an era when the, when the United States was very inclusive. Peoples from all over the world would migrate there, uh, Europeans, Jews, but then also peoples from uh, India, Pakistan, and be given equal opportunity. And until uh, the immigrant population crossed a certain size, and uh, until that time, and while the United States was the dominant power and was uh, economically prosperous, the U.S. was, I think, a model of, um, of inclusivism, a melting pot. And because it was a melting pot and because it could harness the, the potential that was present in its citizens, it was able to become a world power. Scientifically, we saw that the best scientists from across the world, well, Einstein in 19... 40 or thereabouts, but all the best scientists, they migrated to the US, they were welcomed there, and it is they who created the biggest power, economic and scientific in the world, and it remains as such even today. Thank you, thank you very much for this very exciting, uh, very thought-provoking, and very courageous presentation. The theme for this, uh, I mean, this discussion, there, there are so many other aspects that we, we, need, we need to cover. And we plan to take it up in the next lectures also. Next, next, next month, we plan to invite, we know Mumbai, he's very much here. And the very next month, uh, Professor uh, Ishtiak Ahmed Saab has agreed to come. Ishtiak Ahmed, the famous Swedish uh, scholar. But this this lecture was really really uh, so why I can we can easily understand why how how Par Parvez has inspired uh, keeps inspiring generations of students uh, and cities inspiring. So uh, thank you very much for this presentation and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Subhash. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you. It was it was a pleasure being here. Thank you.